Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 37. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I hope you have a great Tuesday. We have an excellent poet today with us. Charles Harper Webb is in the house. He uh, was the very first poet we interviewed at Rattle way back in 1995 in issue number four. And um, before we start, I should say, um, Rattle's a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since that 1995 date, and we just do it for the love of poetry. So if you love poetry too, please click the like button and subscribe and share and all that good stuff, because that is how we please the computer overlords. Um, as I mentioned, Charles was in the um, issue number four of Rattle, uh, which I'm going to show on the screen right here. Um, this is issue number four. It's actually the first perfect bound issue of Rattle. And uh, Charles can't see it right now, but if he checks the uh, replay, he'll be able to see it later. But um, this was um, the fall 1995 issue. You see interview with Charles Harper Webb. And um, the, the issue, if you don't know, Rattle started out as a class chapbook. Um, um, Alan Fox was, uh, is Rattle's founder. And he was in a class with Jack Grapes, um, a local poet uh, who does classes out of his house and um, did a class chat book at the end of the year and he thought it was fun so he kept making them and this was the first issue that was um, a real magazine and not a chat book and the very first interview was with Charles Harper Webb. Now for our warm-up poem today I thought I would start with um, the very first poem in this issue number four. It's a good one. It's by Charles Bukowski and um, I wasn't around in 1995 so I don't know how we ended up getting a Bukowski poem. I don't know what the deal is. We published a few, though, back in the day. And um, this, was a, this was published about, I guess, a year and a half after he died. Uh, but this, is the, this will be our warm-up poem today. This is uh, Charles Bukowski's poem, Writing. You have to wait until it hurts, until it clangs in your ears like the bells of hell, until nothing else counts but it, until it is everything until you can't do anything else but. Then sit down and write, or stand up and write. But write on into it, no matter what the other people are doing, no matter what they will do to you. Crash the lines down, a party of one. What, par what a party, sworn by the light, the time of the time, out of the tips of your fingers. And that was Charles Bukowski's poem, Writing, from Rattle Number 4. Now, um... Uh, Charles Harper Webb, as I mentioned, um, appeared in Rattle Number 4, is Alan Fox's first interview. And um, now he's up to 12 books, I think it is. And um, his newest book is uh, Sidebend World from Pitt Press, which is actually, if I'm being perfectly honest, my favorite press. And um, it's a little washed out because I have the lights on for the for the text later, but but this is Sidebend World by Charles Harper Webb. Um, um, Charles Harper Webb's published 12 books of poetry, including Brain Camp. His awards include the Morse Prize, the Kate Tuff Discovery Award, the Felix Pollock Prize, uh, the Benjamin Salt Prize. A former professional rock musician and psychotherapist, he's the editor of Stand Up Poetry, an expanded anthology, and recipient of a Whiting Writers Award, a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation, and the CSULB Distinguished Faculty Teaching Award. He's a professor of English at Cal State Long Beach, where he teaches in the MFA program. And uh, here he is, Charles Harper Webb. Hey, Charles, how you doing? Hi, pretty good, pretty good. I'm on now. Yep. <laughs> you're on, and you're good to go. And, and you have a great, great connection now. So the the image buffered up good, and we got good sound and a good feed. So um, it's great to see you today. Great. Well, it's great to be here. This is this is fun. Uh, I mean, it's it's an event. I mean, I'm I'm so sick of sitting around in my house. You know, I mean, this is like hitting the big time. <laughs> Have you have you been have you really left the house at all and and again for at least some, well, some I, walks at least? <laughs> I did. Yeah, yeah, I walk I walk about half an hour a day and I do some exercises. You know, I'm listening to James Joyce right now. I'm listening to Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and I do exercises to that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's pretty pretty dull. I, luckily, my wife and I have fun together, and that's good. Well, I'm so glad that we could uh, we could sit down with you today and uh, and share some poems and, and talk a little bit. Um, usually, I see you at the LA Times Festival of Books. You're like a staple there, and I'm in in the crowd right. watching and enjoying. Um, do you want to start us out with a poem from from Sign Bed World? Okay. Sure. Well, I'm. Uh, I figured I'd start with the title poem, Side Bend World, uh, because I think a lot of my poems do have a little 
you know, like like Emily Dickinson said, tell the truth, but tell it slant. And a side bend is a way to look at the world uh, in a slanted way. So here it is, side bend world. When I lean to my right, left arm stretched over my head to help relax back muscles knotted up from hefting heavy luggage yesterday, the purple dawn brushed ocean tilts to my right too. All scorpion fish and whales and giant squid tilt right, having to swim now on an angle to parallel the surface of the sea that swells and settles, swells and settles on an angle that increases the farther to my right I go. All cars in the condo parking lot incline, the maps, rental contracts, half-eaten burgers boxed and forgotten in vacationers' trunks shift slide, fall to the right side. All waves tilt as they roar toward shore like humpback monsters hissing angry spume that leans as does the lava Kilauea extruded last night at every tree and shrub now dressed up in day-glow green. Doves in flight, cuck, 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 like scouts that shout a warning, palm to slanted palm, bird-brained egotist. They think the cosmos orbits around them. Speaking of which, the sky tilts and the clouds tinted orange and pink and the air which gleams pale blue. The faded sliver of a moon tilts, insisting I'm still here. And way up high, the planets spinning through space feel themselves, if they can feel, shifting right until I straighten and the universe does too. And that was the title poem from Side Bend World. Um, that's a great poem to start out with because I always um, feel like you, when I read one of your poems, I always feel like my thought is like he had fun with that one. Like it seems like you just have so much, um, like take so much pleasure in just messing around with the universe in your head and, and shifting things and distorting right. things. And, um, and then is that your philosophy um, for writing? Do you, do you sort of please yourself first, would you say? And then, and then if, if you're amused, other people will be amused and entertained and well, learn that's something certainly, too. That's certainly, that's certainly part of it. Yeah, I, I, like, I look at poetry as a way of, of renewing my interest in the world. And as one gets older, as you know, you, there's, there's way too much of the been there, done that, bought the, sh bought the t-shirt kind of thing. So I like to look at the world literally slanted and see if I can, f I know, reestablish the wonderfulness like the children feel when they see something for the first time. If I can do that, I feel great, you know, and I, and I do like to have fun with it. I, I, I feel, you know, Frost said something like, no surprise for the uh, writer, no surprise for the reader. And I think no fun for the writer, no fun for mm -hmm. the reader. And mm -hmm. I want readers to enjoy my stuff. I mean, I, you know, not just, it's not just a bunch of yucks, but I, I, but I hope that, that people will be entertained by what mm -hmm. I do. Well, we definitely are. Um, since we're talking about a little bit about how you write already, um, I was looking at this interview and um, I wonder if you still do it this way. Let me put this on screen and I'll read it to you, what you said back in 1995. But Alan, Alan yeah, asked, um, he asked about how you write. And he said, I write over long periods of time because I write in a notebook and then pick things almost at random from the notebook to see what I can do with it and sort of let inspiration strike twice. And then I work over That's a period right. of weeks or months. I don't just work on one poem at a time. I work on a lot of things at once. Um, um, I just find I need a certain amount of time and maybe a good deal of time to really get clear on what the poem's about and to be able to distance myself from it to the point where I'm not, it's not like something I wrote. Um, anyway, so that was your process in 1995. Is that still your process today, would you say? That, I'm thinking that guy sounds <laughs> like he the way I do. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how I still do. Yeah. And, and with a yeah, notebook that, too? Every, uh well, when I talk about a notebook, I don't, I don't mean a spiral notebook. It's, a, it's a, a folder or a series of folders that have got loose leaf pages in them. But that's what I call my notebook. And uh, yeah, and I love, yeah, ex that's exactly, I, I said that very well. I couldn't say it better now. <laughs> um, let me say before, um, 
um, we get you to read a couple more poems. Um, if anybody has any questions uh, for Charles, just ask. I'm watching. Um, the main thing I watch is the uh, YouTube chat window, so the live chat. So ask there. If you're watching on Facebook, I keep less of an eye on Facebook, um, but I'll, I'll keep an eye over there. There's 20 people watching on Facebook, um, 20 people watching on YouTube. And then on, if you're watching on Twitter or Periscope, you're just shit out of luck because I don't pay attention to those two. It's plenty. Um, so, so leave a question for Charles if you have any um, questions or anything you'd like him to ask, but let's hear like maybe two two poems, Charles. How about that? Okay. Um, well, here's another one that I, I enjoy doing, uh, and it, it also started in, as a playful idea. It's called Evolution of Love Poetry, and and I'm I'm very interested in anthropology, and I was just thinking, well, as as people evolved their love poetry would evolve too and and i thought well that's an interesting idea so so this is evolution of love poetry and this is dedicated to karen who is watching in the next room my wife uh, so it's in four parts part one homo erectus molds a woman's shape in sand beside the river where she comes to drink between breasts he formed with his own hands he leaves two gold minnows, one silver snail. Two, Cro-Magnon man paints human fingers, uh, sorry, Cro-Magnon man paints human figures in a cave. His holds a spear and wears elk antlers. Hers picks blue lupins. Will she understand that he picks her? Three, Pa Ankentoff paces in his mud brick room, avoiding rock chips on the floor. He frowns at the hieroglyphs he's carved so far. My love is like... Four. Flavia, sated, naps beside a man with two pillows under his head and a sheet of vellum propped against his knees. As turtles float, in a clear pool and white clouds drift across a sky of aqua blue the man strokes flavia's hair then writes the greatest love poem possible in the long dark ages without you you can see i i just sort of start to explore an idea and see what happens and if i like what happens then i may keep it as a poem um Okay, this next one, you said two, so here goes another one. Um, this was inspired by the late lamented Weekly World News, which I used to love to read uh, as I was waiting in line um, at the checkout, at the, at the supermarket checkout. Um, now I'd be worried there'd be COVID all over it, but uh, at the time I didn't worry about that. And one, the, and one of the characters, this was like a... a it purported to be a newspaper, but it was really like a surrealist journal. Some of you may have, have seen it. And they had various characters. Uh, one of the characters was Bat Boy. He kept coming up. I mean, this was a supposedly a man that looked like a bat that was found in a cave in Romania. But another one that they, they had all the time was the world's fattest man. And I, I like the world's fattest man. So... Uh, this was a headline from the Weekly World News. World's fattest man is missing. When I weighed 200 pounds, no one could miss me. Sunny day play school trucked in a special desk and let me use the teacher's pot. Did you see that, people would say? At 400, I started fading. When the boys chose sides, they didn't look at me. When I asked Tina to the prom, she turned as if I weren't there. At half a ton, I couldn't squeeze out of my house to be seen. I dodged mirrors like a vampire, so they stopped reflecting me. Now, people stare at my photo. Bloated toad with tiny tadpole feet. My pea head grinning like the world's biggest 3,010 pound joke. In person, I'm like Earth's curvature, my scale too vast to see. People mistake me for some water sculpted mountain. Parts keep avalanching down. Once the flesh quits quivering, I'm very still. 
Matter ceases to exist when movement stops. That is my goal as I sit, absorbing stillness. Or is it absorbing me? House flies doze on my forehead. Spiders nest in every crack. Soon my weight will make me fall into myself. My gravity so strong, not even light escapes. Thanks, Charles. And there were two more poems from uh, Sidebin World. And those are great examples, both of them, of um, your style to me, I think, too, because you... We already talked about how entertaining your poems are and how much fun you have, but then there's always some kind of meaning that you find that for a poem that successful, you know, that, that you end up publishing, it feels like, um, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not just entertainment, but it's, it's learning and, and discovery too, at the same time. Um, uh, there's two questions. I think these are, yeah, these are separate people that ask the same question, both on Facebook and um, YouTube. So let me, let me pass this along. Do you read your work aloud as you write? Yeah. 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 I read it aloud a lot it, because it, it matters very much how it sounds to me. I mean, uh, I, I heard, I think it was uh, Kenneth Koch who said that poetry is a language in which, in which sound is equally important with meaning. Some people seem to take it where sound is everything and meaning isn't very much, but for me, it's, it's equal. And, and the sound of course conveys meaning. And so, yeah, I, I read the poems aloud a lot. Mm -hmm. It uh, it really helps. I mean, if I it it's like it gets it gets more of my brain involved in the process. Yeah, yeah. There's somehow I I was talking to somebody uh, recently, and they said that that language itself knows or something. You have to trust language to find the right, and, and that's kind of how it works too. Like you know, just the words itself and the music of it tell you where to go. Um, they can't. Uh, Vicky Miko asks if you could talk a little about stream of consciousness uh, and or automatic writing. Do you do you do do you feel like you have stream of consciousness going on as you write? Uh, I I use a device kind of like that. Anybody who's been in my poetry classes knows that I that I actually try to give them a little taste of free writing where you just write as quickly as you can without uh, any self censorship and just see what comes out. It's a way of 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 helping your helping yourself move past the conscious mind and down into the unconscious mind, which is where I think the good stuff always lies. So, as much as possible, my rough drafts uh, partake very much of a stream of consciousness, automatic writing kind of way. I just write whatever comes to me, and trust that some of it will end up being interesting. And if it's not, oh well, I'll do it again tomorrow. You know, it's not. That's a great thing about poetry. Plenty of poems can fail, and you can still have poems that work really well. I mean, you mentioned that thing about that. There's some. There's some meaning or something else going on besides entertainment. If I do, I, I, I think you mentioned. I, I worked for quite a while as a psychotherapist. And I'm very interested in 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 the psychology of the human being, and and I try to. I look for a psychological truth in my poems, and and sometimes they're just spinning their wheels. But the ones I keep are the ones that do find what I think is a psychological truth, and that that comes out of that sort of free writing. I surprise myself with it. If I if I know what I'm going to find before I start the poem, I don't bother. I tell my students that's an essay. When you know what it is you want to say, and and you're you're your intention is to teach or to explain or something like that. That's an essay. That's a great form, but it's not a poem, not to me. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things I wanted to talk about was was your your work as a psychotherapist. But um, but where do you think um poems come from? Like, where's the source of that? Is is it a Jungian thing? Is there some kind of collective epigenetic memory that we're tapping into? Is it just shared experience and the way that we're sort of our brains are sort of programmed to have similar reactions to circumstances. Like what makes a poem resonate among a lot of readers, do you think? And, and what is that psychological truth? Where does that come from? I, I think that, that it resonates, a poem will resonate in, among a lot of readers. Uh, if you manage to, to find something to say that a lot of readers share with you. I mean, humans, I mean, for, well, well, Jung and his idea of the collective unconscious uh, 
it, 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 I mean, behind that idea is the idea that however it gets into our heads, humans are very similar and we have a lot of similar experiences. And, you know, most of us have an, have an icon in our head that says mother and we have an icon in our head that says the sea, if you've ever seen it, or if you've seen mountains, mountains or father or something like that. And we all have those things. We all f- you know, experience death. We all confront death. We all confront birth. We all confront love, hopefully. Um, and, uh, so, so that stuff, whether it's pre-programmed into us or whether we learn it, um, it's, it's in, it goes into the unconscious. It's there. And, and the unconscious, I always say that that's the, that's the dreamland. That's where, that's where the mind is busy putting together things in unusual ways. The, the conscious mind is generally concerned with, with moving efficiently through the world, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and, and, and that's great, and we need it. Uh, without the conscious mind, what Freud called the ego, you're just flailing. You're not going to make it in the society. You can't, you can't work in a society if you haven't got a pretty good uh, ego, which is the, you know, the... the 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 chief that that orders said go here you you got an appointment at three oh you're going to be on uh, rattle at six show up that kind of thing you know but that's not where the poems come from they come from this other area um, you know the the idea of the poet lying under a tree and just looking up and and contemplating life is is just another way of 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 accessing the unconscious you you throw away the the, the ego that wants to direct everything and you just say, well, what comes drifting by my head? You know, what comes through my mind? What interesting thing? And and when one comes by that you like, you say, oh, that might that might be something. And then you work with it if you're a poet and you see what happens. You might find, you know, you might find that it's wonderful. You might find that it doesn't amount to much, but it's still fun to look. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great, great answer. Thanks, Charles. Um, we have a request. Um, I don't know if it's okay. going to work if you have the book handy, but uh, Jim Velva says, my favorite of your poems is Prayer for the Man Who Mugged My Father, 72. Oh. And he'd love to hear you talk about that. And then everybody's asking if you could read it. Do you have a... Uh, do you have yeah, okay. Have I'll have to get up. But yeah, I can find yeah. it. That's easy. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Hey, yeah, so we're waiting for Charles Harper Webb to uh, come back with um, that poem. But... Um, yeah, I'm I, I'm not familiar with that, or at least off the top of my head. So uh, thanks for the request, Jim, and um, and here he is. Okay, got yeah. it. I've got to put this thing on my lap in case the cat jumps up, because otherwise she'll scratch. Yeah, me. we've had some cat catastrophes already on these shows. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah jumping man, in front of the clock. screen. Yeah, yeah, it's they're tough. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is a poem. This is a, an older one. Uh, it was in. Uh, uh, well, it's it's now it's easiest found in Shadow Ball, which is also from from Pitt. It's a new and selected, uh, but it was in a, a book called Reading the Water. Prayer for the man who mugged my father. Seventy two. May there be an afterlife. May you meet him there, the same age as you. May the meeting take place in a small locked room. May the bushes where you hid be there again, leaves tipped with razor blades and acid. May the rifle butt you bashed him with be in his hands. May the glass in his car window, which you smashed as he sat stopped at a red light, spike the rifle butt and the concrete on which you'll fall. May the needles the doctors use to close his eye stab your pupils every time you hit the wall and then the floor, which will be often. May my father let you cower for a while, whimpering, please don't shoot me, please. May he laugh, unload your gun, toss it away. Then may he take you with bare hands. May those hands which taught his son to throw a curve and drive a nail and hold a frog feel like cannonballs against your jaw. May his arms which powered handstands and made their muscles jump to please me wrap your head and grind your face like stone. May his chest thick and hairy as a bear's feel like a bear snapping your bones. May his feet 
which showed me the flutter kick and carried me miles through the woods feel like axes crushing your one claim to manhood as he chops you down. And when you are down, and he's done with you, which will be soon, since even one-eyed with brain damage, he's a merciful man. May the door to the room open and let him stride away to the Valhalla he deserves. May you, bleeding, broken, drag yourself upright. May you think the worst is over. You've survived and may still win. Then may the door open once more. And let me. Mm. That's a great poem. Um, yeah, thanks for no. sharing that, Charles. And it reminds me of um, my grandfather was mugged in the same way, about the same age. And just the, it's one of the saddest things I can remember. I was only like maybe 10 or something. Um, and um, just the huge black eye and the busted jaw. And like, how could you, you know, hit an old man like that who's been through so much? Um, mm. Can you talk a little bit about that poem and what it means to you? Since that's what, what um, Jim Vallis yeah, is really well, asking. Sure. Well, unfortunately, that was pretty true. I mean, the, the incidents in there. Uh, and and this happened to my father when I was already living in L.A. I think I was already teaching at Cal State Long Beach. Um, and, you know, I, I heard about it from my, my sister and my mom. And and I felt obviously here I am in L.A. I mean, my first thought was I want to find that guy. and I want to eviscerate him. Uh, and, of course, I couldn't because, first of all, they couldn't find him even in Houston. The cops never found him. Uh, and, I, you know, obviously I couldn't do it. And I couldn't sleep that night for just raging and thinking about it. And I did something that I've told many of my clients uh, to do as a, when I was a psychotherapist, which when you're obsessing on something, just get up and write it down. Uh, so I wrote down what turned out to be the first draft of this poem. I did not expect it to be a poem that was strictly therapy, strictly a way to go to sleep and to get some of it out of my head. And I, I kept the thing in a drawer for for a while. And uh, and one day, um, several poets were over. I can't remember everybody. One of them was Laurel Ann Bogan. And, and we were talking about, I don't know, taboo poems or something like that. And I just thought, you know, I've got this thing that I fooled around with. And I came in and, re and read an early draft of that poem. And uh, I wish I could remember who was there. But some of the people were kind of shocked by it. And, and sometimes people still are. They're put off by the violence. Uh, but I thought, you know, I think I got something here. And I, I worked on it and I put it together. And, and it did get published. And it seems to be... If people are going to ask for a poem of mine, that's probably the one they ask for. Uh, it, it turned out to speak to a lot of people. And, yeah, I have gotten, if you look on, my son thinks this is funny. If you look on the Internet, you can find some people love the poem and some people really think that I'm kind of a monster for writing it. And, uh, you know, they, they say it's too violent. And, and my standard answer to that is no, it's not violent enough. It doesn't come close to being violent enough. It's just what you can do in words. It's interesting that you say that um, people love and hate it, because that's something that's always been my experience just publishing poems, is that the poems that, that people love the most are also the poems that people have a, a, a reaction to where they sort of want to flee from it. Um, mm. And I always kind of feel like that's a, that, um, you know, it's the psychological power of something that's like too intense for some people. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if a poem is really successful as a kind of magic spell that transforms you and takes you into a new place, I think some people react by saying, like, I don't want to go to a new place. I don't want to be somebody else. I don't want to be right. that person who's smashing someone's head into the wall. Um, right. And that's uh, that's the unconscious there, too. The unconscious, Freud said, that's where all the, the primitive drives are. That's where the id lives. And uh, and we are, you know, anybody who doesn't want to admit it isn't looking around. We're we're inherently violent animals. Watch a chimpanzee, and they've got what? What have Jane Goodall said? What they got? Ninety-eight percent of our of our DNA, or something. Watch them have a tantrum and shriek and tear stuff up. So when when somebody that you love is assaulted and damn near killed, I mean, you know, that's not the kind of thing I just sit by and say, oh well, you know, oh I'll be, you know, one of the things that I did with this poem is set it up 
in such a way, I knew that this would happen, that some people are going to wait for the transition where I forgive at the end. And I purposely said, no, that's not happening. There is no forgiveness for a crime like that. Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you term. mentioned that. That's exactly what was going through my mind. Like, how is he going to turn this into a, a forgiveness? And then and then you don't, which is really their power of <laughs> the poem, actually, is that you... That's, yeah, that's the really yeah. what makes it more than just gratuitous violence or revenge or something, is that you... Um, sort of come to terms with the fact that you don't forgive or something through the way the poem right. is structured. Yeah, yeah, that's why it works really well. Um, Jay Perry asks a follow-up question. Um, what did your father think of the poem? Did he read it? He did not, uh, because unfortunately, uh, this this gets worse. I mean, that, um, that injury that he received led... In a, maybe six months later, before I'd showed the poem to anybody, it led him to have the first of uh, several strokes oh, that no. wiped him out. So, yeah, so he never saw it. He never heard it. He never knew anything about yeah. it. Well, but but I but I know him. He would have loved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a great one. I'm glad. Thanks, to, thanks to Jim Valbus, for, for asking to hear that. Yeah. Um, do you want to read maybe another poem from the book? Sure. Let's see. Oh, I, here, I just almost saw this one. The, the, uh, sometimes it's fun to set yourself uh, just a goal. And this is a goal that a lot of poets set themselves. But I just set myself a goal of writing a poem that was one long sentence. And to see what I could do with that. Um, I mean, I didn't. What I did was I, I, I had the idea for the poem. And then as I as I wrote it, I thought, oh, this needs to be just one long sentence. But you know, I, I, I talked about the, the weekly world news, seeing that as I as I stood at uh, the checkout stand. And another thing that that uh, I see and everyone sees as they sit by or stand by the checkout stand is is these various glamour magazines with beautiful women on the front of them. And, you know, whether it's Cosmopolitan or in this case, Glamour magazine. And this this provoked this particular poem. Uh, and the uh, the title is the first line, so I'll just go right through it. <clears throat> the woman on the cover of Glamour magazine would not look twice at me. She's so spunky, confident, devil-may-care in her crimson blouse, her violet eyes so full of tigress in bed and tyrant in the boardroom that her auburn hair waves in the breeze of her own forcefulness, tousled and churning as if she's flying her latest rescue, lucky man, like a babe in her slim, muscular arms, hearing the cheers of, earth, of earthbound females who think they can be her by shooting metaphors metaphorically, this magazine into their veins, whence it will blast its magic to their brains as she streaks on her own power through clouds, puffy pink as pillows on the Louis XIV bed in which she deigns to sip the world's best wine before attacking the Krav Maga workout that keeps her abs so tight, her buns so trim, her shoulders able to heft effortlessly the weight of her natural D cups, even hunched over the equation she's developing to link at last general relativity with the quantum world of ultra tiny particles one of which i am compared to her Ooh, thanks Charles. i was gonna get a drink of water after that that was uh, the woman on the cover of glamour magazine from sidebend world um see there's another question uh this is Catherine friedman she asks uh, how many drafts or revisions does a really good poem take i think there's a perception that good poetry just sort of happens without much effort do you have the muse or, or you have the muse or not um yeah. is it yeah i think that perception at least in my case is dead wrong because uh if if i had to only stand on the poems as i write them the first time i wouldn't be here nobody would care anything about what i said uh I, I have to work really hard at them, and, and I don't have a particular number of drafts that I go through, but um, it's a lot. And it, because because I do, I, I, I take the raw material that the unconscious, if I'm lucky, gives me, and and then I have to find out what it's talking about. I have to find out, why are you saying this stuff to me, unconscious? And and is there something at the bottom of this? 
if and, and I have to work with the poems as I'm doing it. I have to shape them. I I I have to trim them. I have to say, well, this is important. This isn't. Throw it out. This sounds good. This doesn't. It's this l- elaborate process by which I move back and forth from conscious to unconscious, and all this takes work. Uh, and so, in the end, if something comes out good, then, like, first of all, I'm always immensely grateful because it easily could not have. And uh, and but I I don't know what it is before I start. I have to really work my way through it. It's like trying to uh, an, an analogy that I use uh, with my students sometimes. It's like an archaeologist who's walking along a a, a valley and and a bunch of stones and he sees some tiny little thing sticking out of the rock and you don't know what it is you just think that's interesting what would happen if i dug there and uh, sometimes you get a tyrannosaurus rex and sometimes you get a, you know a, a busted shell or something i don't know but but yeah so so i have to go through a lot of drafts uh, and but yates said this and i completely agree uh, a good poet including him uh, will bust their behind to try to make it seem like it just was something tossed off. Just, oh, this just came to me. I just jotted this down. Uh, so I try to sound, I, tr- I try to make a lot of my poems sound casual and easy and, and fun, but I work my rear end off doing it. Here comes the cat. She's here. <laughs> Hello, cat. What, what's the cat's name? <laughs> the cat's name is... <laughs> We we used to call her Puffy Kitty, but my wife called her Fatty, so now she's Fatty because <laughs> she's pretty hefty. Um, one of the things you kind of alluded to a couple times that I'm always interested in is is poetry as like an act of healing, and about how the sub it see it feels to me like um like what you know you mentioned the subconscious wanting to tell you something you know and it seems to me what the mm-hmm. subconscious wants to do is is synthesis with the conscious or something where like it knows something you know because I, I feel like it's right right brain left brain kind of thing too where the right brain sort of has this holistic understanding of the world but doesn't have capacity to add to the map we make of the world and the language centers that that make the most meaning and so it's sort of desperate to tell us something um, and, mm. and that, and then we're sort of trying to figure out like, what the hell are you saying? But we don't know what it's yeah. saying because we don't speak the same language as the subconscious. Do you, do you, is that a, is that a model that fits with you? And, and how is that healing as a psychotherapist? Cause you mentioned having people write, um, do you think yeah. that's something that you, you know, you end up better, you know, more integrated or something after writing? I, I think, I think so. I think, I think there's, there's, it, Many, many different ways in which writing is is healing. Uh, I think it tends to be healing simply to voice the truth. That doesn't always mean that it's going to be art. That's another thing. I mean, there are there are poems which are wonderful poems, but they're they're poems that are wonderful for the writer as his or her own psychotherapy. They don't translate into the outer world, but they're still really useful because if you just can speak your truth and say, yeah, you know, that's really what it is. That in itself is, heck, that, that's, that's half the battle or maybe more of the battle in psychotherapy just to get you to see that's what it is. That's it. That's it. I've been, I've been tormented by something and now I can name it so that's uh, that's very healing uh, I think I think humans feel better when they can name something uh, I think I think it's more anxiety producing when you can't but uh, I just think there's all kinds of ways that that it's that it's healing I think that that to be able to to for instance stand in front of a class uh, I mean, I'm talking about in my poetry writing classes where they read their poems and and just say, this is mine. I said this. These are my words. Not very many people get the chance to do that in that way. And I think it's really good for your your self con your self uh, confidence to simply be able to say, yeah, I wrote that. That's what I think about this. And I've thought about it a lot. And this is the very best. This is the best thought that I have on this subject. And I stand behind it. You know, ask you, you know, very few people can do that. I mean, that's my experience. Most people waffle and get nervous. I know that uh, it was not easy for me. I, 
you know, I think you probably mentioned I played in bands for a while. I, I played in bands for a long time, and I I, I lost my stage fright fairly early. Um, but the first time I stood up to do a poetry reading at University of Washington, I didn't have my guitar in front of me. I didn't have my band behind me. It was just me. I didn't even have a tune. It was just me and my words. I'm shaking. I still remember it. I was really nervous because I got nothing to hide behind. This is just me, folks. So, uh, yeah, that's that's healing to be able to do that's that. That's really cool. That's a, that's an insight that I hadn't thought of. I hadn't thought of that aspect of it, but definitely I can see. It also was something I was going to ask you about uh, being uh, in a rock band, if, if that helped you with performance and, and stage fright and things like that or not. So um, apparently oh, yeah. not. Uh, no, it, no, it helped me a lot, At, but but I had to make a different. You know, once once I made that transition and said, you know, then I they said, okay, I I'm okay with standing up behind my own words. Then all the stuff that I learned in uh, in, in in bands uh, was useful. So, see, for instance, I like. I like doing shows like this. I like doing readings. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't ever get nervous or if I do get nervous a little bit, it, it makes me better, I think. Uh, but yeah, so, so, and another thing I learned from playing in rock and roll bands is that is, is that you owe it to the audience to entertain them and you're a fool if you don't pay attention to the audience. I think a lot of poets just think, well, hey, you know, pearls before swine. Here's my brilliance. You know, grovel on the floor and eat it up, scum. You know, and I, I just never think of the audience that way at all. I mean, I think I think of the audience as my peers with whom I want to share something. I've got, it's like, you know, an, another example is that I've been walking along and I found something on the road really cool. And I think this is great. I want to show everybody this thing I found. It happens it was a thing in my brain, but I still think it was cool and I and I and I want to share it with other people. And if they don't understand it, if they don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sad. And I feel like maybe I blew it. Maybe I didn't do it well enough. Cuz I really want to communicate with with the audience. That's why I do it. You know, otherwise I'd just have my notebooks and I'd read them and think, oh, boy, are you a smart guy? <laughs> you know, I just that just wouldn't. That, I mean, that's not it at all. It's not about that. It's about saying, hey, you know, yeah, I want to share this. Do you have any advice for uh, for poets giving readings and, and trying to connect with the audience? Like, is there a way that you do it? Because you, you do do it well. I just try to be honest about it. I mean, and I try, I try to, to just let the truth come out that I really want the audience to enjoy what I'm doing. I really want them to get something out of it. I want to share my enjoyment with them. And, uh, and, and I learned that, well, that's why I like to play music, too. I mean, it's great to, to be, you know, like, like I used to be the lead guitar player and the lead singer, and I'm up there singing a song and looking at the crowd and they're dancing and they're yelling and they're having a great time. And that just made me feel wonderful. I mean, I just felt like, wow, I'm doing something good here. And, and that's, uh, you know, it, in some, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else I can say but that. Yeah, well, there are a lot of really great questions. I try to make this as interactive as I can because I like to feel like we're all sitting around in our living rooms enjoying poetry together. And um, so let me try to pass as many as I can get to uh, onto you here. Amy Miller, uh, who I think is the Amy Miller we published, I assume, a bunch. Uh, she says, hi, Charles. Could you talk about persona poems, like the World's Fattest Man poem that you read earlier? Um, are there risks in speaking for someone else? Well, um, I think it's I think it's a really interesting using a persona is is an interesting way of, of accessing things that I might not otherwise have accessed. And I suppose it, it, nowadays there does seem to be a risk if you say anything about anybody who isn't 100 percent you, somebody's going to think you're appropriating their life. But I don't really care about that stuff, to tell you the truth. My only what I really care about is trying to trying to create if I'm going to do, create a persona, I want it to be an effective one. And. Uh, and and I want to, you know, I, I want the, as an artist, I want to have my imagination as unfettered as possible. That's part of the fun of it. 
so yeah, when I, I when I took that world's fat, fattest man poem, I had no idea where it was going to go, and I, I usually take things that strike me as funny, and that's what I start with. But almost immediately, that poem went somewhere else, and I realized, and I began seeing the pathos of it, and uh, and, and just kind of following that, and then. And just seeing, you know, I just let my imagination lead me. So if the poem works for an audience, it's because they found something true in it and psychologically insightful and maybe interesting and maybe some, you know, maybe some of that, oh, I never thought of it that way. And if they find it, you know, if it doesn't work for them, they may think, oh, he's making fun of fat people. That I mean, he, you know, that's not what I'm doing, but, you know, people may think what they think. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, it's, it wouldn't be the first time that somebody misinterpreted one of my poems. And, and once it's out there in the world, I mean, I have no power to tell them, you know, oh, that's wrong. That's the wrong interpretation. I mean, if they want to think that, they can think that. So, so yeah, I, I, I like to do persona poems, but I do, you know, I think there's a lot of not very good persona poems. Uh, but did something just go wrong oh, no, here? I, I think good. I... Oh, okay. I've got something on my com- com- on my screen that's odd. But anyway, as long as you can see me, I'm no, fine. No, I see you and hear you. Um, let's. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see you and hear you. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, the um, let's see. The other question. We have two recommendation requests. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Vicky Miko says, "What female poets and or musical artists do you relate to or admire?" And then, oh, it's Vicky again, but she says if you could recommend any books for new poets. So uh, female poets and new poets. Dorian Lux. Yeah. Dor- Dorian Lux is, is, is great. Tim Adonisio is another one I really like. Denise Duhamel is another one that I really like. I mean, I, you know, Suzanne Lummis, our local, uh, you know, I mean, those are just four names. And that doesn't mean that every anytime I'm asked something like that, all the people I'm leaving out, they're, they're hu- great ones. But those, those just jumped into my head because I, I recommend them to students all the time. Uh, music, I, I, the first thing I think of is Joni Mitchell. She was fabulous. Uh, you know, I mean, so, so I don't know if there, is that enough? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good. I think that's good. Um, and then what about books for new poets though? Is there any book that you'd recommend for somebody starting out in poetry? Um, I don't know if she means, you know, as a guide book, like speaking of Dorian Lux, she has a really good one. Um, yeah, she or, um, um, and she's going to be, I should mention, she's gonna be on the rattle cast in June. So, so stick around for her. Um, but, but for, you know, books to read and, you know, learn how to learn craft from, I guess, is the, is the heart of that. Well, question. you know, another good one is uh, is by Steve Cowett, who actually was Dorian's teacher when she first began. Cowett has a book called In the Palm of Your Hand, which I use in my poetry uh, classes. And and it's a, it's a very readable, excellent book full of exercises that actually can produce good poems and uh so that's uh, that's one if you if you uh, want a a compilation of poems that people usually like i'll plug my own stand up poetry because that's a i i i edited that book uh in order to collect it well it came out of a collection i made for my students at cal state long beach because i wanted to have some poems that i knew they'd like you know <laughs> Uh, so that's a good that's that's a good book to start with, and and you can find some poems that that almost certainly you would like, and they're accessible, and and I don't, and accessible doesn't mean stupid or dumbed down. It means that that they care about the audience in the way that I was describing that I do. So those would be some things I I've think about. I've actually never read that book. Uh, is that a, is that an anthology of poems, or is that a, a guidebook with stand up mm-hmm, poetry? Yeah. yeah, it's an anthology. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've had, there's been three versions of it, and the reason the last one's called uh, Stand Up Poetry and Expanded Anthology is because it's the long, the longest one, and and the University of Iowa who published it wanted a title to separate it from the other ones. So, um, Alexander Umless, who we've published a bunch of times, so just uh, this weekend. I know, I know her. I've heard yeah. of her before. There's a, there's a woman poet uh, to listen she, she to. She says everyone should read your book. A million MFAs are not enough, which is another book I'm not oh, familiar yeah. with. Is that what is that? Well, that's a book of essays, 
uh, Red Hand published it, and and I'm very grateful to them for doing it. Uh, a lot of the essays were published in the AWP Chronicle, uh, the Writers Chronicle, they call it. But but they're 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 craft essays, craft uh, essays on different poets, effort, essays about about writing poetry and what works and what doesn't work and some poets that I think are really good and why I think that and stuff like that. Thanks, Alex, <laughs> for the plug. But yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, I think it's a potentially valuable book. It, it certainly is a valuable book if you think anything I'm doing is valid because it will tell you an awful lot about at least where I come from is poetry, and I think that others come from that place too. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. I'll have to check that out. Um, I don't know how I missed that. Um, do you want to read, maybe we have about nine minutes left, if you want to read two more poems to maybe close it out. Sure. I don't know if that's a good estimate sure. of time. but be glad to do that. Uh, okay, I'm going to read, uh, I'll, I'll read one that seems kind of uh, prophetic, though it doesn't mention anything about disease. This is um, this is a poem that that looks at a, at a kind of uh, a knife that was a pseudo Japanese knife called a Ginsu knife. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but that was in in the eighties. They were everywhere, and I still have one. The things are really good. I mean, it's fallen apart, but it's still cut. <laughs> but anyway, this was from a, a different time, um, and uh, a time before COVID and before a lot of stuff. Um, it's called Ginsu. Never need sharpening knife that zipped through auto hoses, tree limbs, carpet, metal, bone, that came in sets of 12, plus greater, chopper, apple corer, egg slicer, fruit and potato peeler, juicer, blender, spiraler, recipe book, and lifetime guarantee, even if the damage was my fault. Wonder of the 80s. Price so low, I feared a scam. Ginsu, burnished samurai blades, Zen masters who practiced swordplay, then snoozed as if war were a pillow fight. The little boy fat man fallout had blown away, leaving the Japanese our masters of cheap technology. I loved knowing the knives were there, Board boy scouts of cutlery, always prepared. Those were American days. Russia collapsed in a red heap. Our freeways reaching out, stocks climbing, enemies misguided, small and impotent. We waxed our cars, surfed Malibu, and drove our kids to Flint Ridge Prep on the way to Harvard Law. Our airplanes flew super glued into the sky and landed gently as monarch butterflies. We owned the air. God like as New York's twin towers. All disease was curable or soon would be. No knot was too Gordian to slice and dice or fricassee. Sharp as Excalibur, clean lined and gleaming, we were unstoppable, indestructible, lifetime guaranteed. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll finish with, with the last poem in the book. Uh, which is all about appropriation, but it's about the kind of appropriation that happens when you really resonate with a piece of art. So this is called Down the Bayou. One verse into Jambalaya, and I'm pulling my pirogue down the bayou under beards of Spanish moss. I'm wrestling a bull gator for its scaly steaks. I'm telling Yvonne I don't much like Big Mac's me, while crunching crawfish, which creeped me out before, I'm rocking at the fey dodo, accordions pumping and wheezing as couples two-step on the houseboat floor. Hey, the Sopranos are on TV. Five minutes in, I'm calling guys Frankie the Frog and Lenny Lasagna, swigging vino, yelling, forget about it, laughing so hard, fusily fusillades the room. I'm placing family over everything, wondering who to whack when my stereo a wedding present from the dawn, blares, she loves you. Suddenly, I'm slurping lobscouse with the lads, tromping through cold Liverpool rain, winking at birds, all of whom I've shagged and now call love. 
Before I'm halfway to me mums, I've written yesterday and help. When George clomps on my foot, I bark, Fook sake, you broke me fucking toe. The girls scream louder. The prettiest take me home as she makes me a nice cup of tea from dark shadows beside her bed. Interview with a vampire hisses, open me. Three pages in, a raven-haired seductress gives me her dark gift. Eternity wraps me in a satin cape, warm and black as the Tuscan night through which my red Ferrari's slicing, me bat-flapping overhead when a pink hummer roars up, blasting fitty scent. Right away, I'm styling down dark bed streets, sweaty from hoops with Mike and Box and Sugar Ray, snug in my ankle length snow leopard coat. I'm king of the hood, one badass muffa, but I take care of my peeps like my hoes take care of me. I strut into Zorba's place to get my props, but one plate of moussaka chased with ouzo, and I'm scarfing appetite in thick cut chops. My laugh embraces every ecstasy. My words deserve a dissertation, but you can't learn life from books. You've got to seize beauty and drive death back with zest and truth and charm. So I link arms with everyone and make the whole place shake. Opa, we yell, staggering drunk, woozy from love's sacred cup. Opa, opa, hard breathing, stomping calloused feet, we hold each other up. That was another poem. Um. Down the Bayou, from uh, Charles Harper's newest book, Sidebend World, from Pitt Press. Charles Harper Webb, thanks so much for joining us. Um, it's as entertaining and insightful, both as I as hoped it would be, based on uh, reading your book. So I really appreciate that you could join us today, and um, hope you have a great night. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. This was great. And, and Tim, thanks for doing Rattle as well as this. I mean, you know, that that's a great mag, and you got, you've, you've done beautifully with it. So I really appreciate being well, here. Yeah, Good night. Right. Thanks, Charles. Bye. <laughs> yes, that was Charles Harper Webb. Um, and once again, his new book is uh, Side Bend World. I think it's about a year old from Pitt Press. Um. You can see uh, University of Pittsburgh Press down there. Find it at upress.pit.edu is the easiest place to find it. Um, and the Pitt Poetry Series, you know, I, I mentioned this before on a different show, but um, I just went through, when we started this um, um, series of uh, podcasts, I went through and looked at Pitt's catalog because they're my favorite press, I think. And um, so I looked at the poets we published recently uh, who had books that were out recently, and that's where uh, I decided to make... Uh, you know, call a lot of these people up and see if we could uh, do a podcast. So if you're if you're new to this show, uh, we have let's see if anyone's called yet. We've had a little open mic, but it's a special open mic, which is just for prompt poems. And every week we have a prompt. And um, last week's prompt, if I can get it on screen for you quickly enough, uh, here it is. Last week's prompt, or, or this week's prompt, I should say, it was an erasure poem using a news article from the past week. And um, we have. Two erasure poems from uh, that were mailed in. Let me see if anybody else sent any in since. Not yet, but if you have one and would like to uh, share yours from this week, uh, you can send it to uh, openmic at rattle.com, and I'll read it for you. Uh, if you're here live, you can call in using our, uh, our special open mic technology, which is um, uh, sending a chat message to Rattle Poetry or calling me up at 818-850-7727. That's... Uh, 818-850-7727 if you'd like to do this. Um, so for for this week's prompt, I have to find... Hang on a second. Okay. Um, so I actually did this week's prompt, which I haven't been lately because I'm buried in, um, in Chapbook Prize. We're announcing the Rattle Chapbook Prize winners tonight, really. Um, so everybody gets it first thing, and um, I've been reading nonstop. But I finally, for the first time in like three weeks, had a chance to do one. Uh, this was my erasure poem. I did it minutes ago. <laughs> I was actually, when I talked to uh, Charles, it was, um, um, I was working on it when he called. Um, so this is an article. All I did was, uh, you can see it's this afternoon. And um, I just scrolled down my Facebook feed and went with the first news article anybody posted, which was, if you can read, March 2020 was the first March without school shooting in the U.S. since 2002 by Sophie Lewis on CBS News. And uh, my erasure is first March in decades, the U.S. shut down 
measure the spread of a new normal, extend rest, those students shooting were born, Mar every march that a gun and a hit list pulled the trigger, but none of those shootings occurred. Every town calls the problem American. Gun dealers said they fear the unknown. Given reality, guns. So that is my erasure poem from this CNN news article. And um, Megan didn't get to make one, so I got one, and she didn't get hers. So um, I feel pretty proud of myself. And now uh, Matthew King sent one in, and uh, he has audio. So if you would like to uh, do audio, you can send an audio too. Um, let's see. Screen view. Here's Matthew King's, and um, here he is playing it, hopefully. Live streaming from the dead. Live streaming to connect from his home, concurrently streaming from the dead. The same stream of the Easter Bunny and 15,000 views on its live stream. If we will all be honest, the church is empty, converting to digital, a faith that can outlast the way we're actually nailed to a practically empty sense of relieving loneliness. Its members are deemed essential, but late on Holy Saturday, he had decided to restrict services to a single church in a statement they'll have to explain to God and the gathering of folks we may not have. Yeah, that was uh, Matthew King reading his poem, Live Streaming from the Dead. And uh, we have one other prompt poem. We only had two this week. It's my fault. I haven't been doing a good job promoting the prompts. So I'm going to do a better job like posting it on social media and stuff. Uh, but it's really fun to have a reason to write a poem. And like I said, if you don't want to read it yourself, I'm happy to read them for you. So just email them to openmic at rattle.com. Now this is uh, Carla Schwartz's poem. She's uh, at CB99 Video. She's a regular contributor over here on the open mics with the, with the prompts. And uh, her poem was uh, Human Condition Dies. And it's an erasure based on John Prine, who chronicled the human condition in song, dies at 73 in the New York Times on April 7th. And here's Carla Schwartz. Human Condition Dies. An erasure poem by Carla Schwartz. It's based on John Prine, who chronicled the human condition in song, dies at 73 by William Grimes in the New York Times, April 7th, 2020. Human condition dies. Raspy voiced, angry comic, relative unknown, sandpapery, literate with tortured songs, past time making silence from feelings to find what he wrote delivers. Few words like Jesus get you into heaven. Forgive the country now scarred by tomfoolery. A worried world is liable to pass you by. Uh, that was Carla Schwartz, a great ending. A worried world is liable to pass you by. Um, excellent erasure poem, The Human Condition Dies. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Um, now next week's prompt will be Here's this week's prompt. Let me uh, pull it up. Uh, next week's prompt is from the point of view of the oldest living tree. So that's next week's prompt. Write a poem from the point of view of the oldest living tree. Um, where I live, uh, the bristlecone pines are up on the, on the um, ridge above us. And they're not the oldest, but they're close to the oldest. There's some, or maybe, I think it, actually, I think the oldest tree is a bristlecone pine, but not here up in Sierra Nevada. Um, so that'll be a fun one to do. Um, once again, the prompt for next week is uh, the, from the point of view of the oldest living tree. So send that on in to uh, openmic at rattle.com and uh, call me up and read it live if you'd like. Uh, it's just a lot of fun, and I'm really looking forward to writing poems again, too, now that, now that my crazy time is over. Every time we have a contest, I am just, um, I, it's, it's a tough time for me, but, um, but I'm glad it's over. Now, um, next week on the show, we're going to have George Bilgier, another, kind of similar to Charles Harper Webb, another very entertaining poet, um, Cleveland-based. He's hosted the radio show Wordplay, so he's definitely comfortable on mic, and uh, his newest book is Blood Pages which I can't remember if that's from Pitt Press or not, 
but it could have been the same sort of run on Pitt Press I made earlier in the year. Uh, George has been in a bunch of issues, including the most recent. So um, tune in next week for that. And um, in the meantime, I hope you have a great week, and I will see you soon. Good night.